Cooks Falls is best known for its brown bears. Yet over the last week, another resident of the area, a gray wolf, has stolen much of our attention. Joining me today to discuss wolves and lend her insight on the behavior of wolves we've seen on the bear cams is Missy Stein, Outreach Coordinator for the International Wolf Center. The International Wolf Center advances the survival of wolf populations by teaching about wolves, the relationship to wildlands, and the human role in their future. They are also one of the newest webcam partners with Explorer.org, and we're grateful for the opportunity to watch their ambassador wolves on, on the wolf cams. And I'm grateful, Missy, for, uh, your, uh, for you joining us today. It's, uh, it's going to be, I think, a great conversation. So thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And we're going to talk a lot about wolves. Uh, before we get into that, though, I want to remind everybody, if you haven't taken our Bear Camp Viewer Survey, please look for the link for that in the featured comment at the bottom of the page. And uh, we're very interested, or I'm very interested in knowing more about your Bear Camp Viewing experience and how that relates to wildlife conservation. So please check that out if you haven't already. Of course, you know, Bear Cam isn't just about bears. We see a variety of wild animals on the Bear Cams. However, we've really never had the opportunity, uh, Missy, to, to watch wolves utilizing Brooks Falls as much as we have right now. I mean, the wolves that use the Brooks River area and Katmai National Park, uh, I mean, it's, they're there. They're there quite frequently, um, but it's a rare opportunity for us to watch them. And since the webcams went live at Brooks River in 2012, we really haven't had the opportunity to watch a wolf fishing at the falls so consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, but bef before we talk about that and maybe the specifics of the wolves at the river, I'd like to discuss uh, some of the basics about wolves, uh, not only for myself, but to help our audience understand their dynamics. Uh, a lot of people know that wolves are social animals, um, but we don't really know, a lot of us don't know very much about their social lives and, um, and the pack units that they happen to live in. So in brief, could you tell us about the social structure of their lives and, um, and help us define what a pack happens to be? Yeah, yeah. So like I said, they, they are social just like humans and they live in a pack. Um, and people have a lot of um, ideas about what they think a pack might be from mythology and fairy tales. Um, but the reality is a pack is just a family unit. Um, and the core is typically a mom and a dad and their offspring from multiple years. Um, and then it can get more complicated from there. Um, because you can have um, sometimes a brother or sister to that mom and dad that has stayed. So the aunt and uncle um, have joined the pack um, when they formed it. Um, sometimes one of the mom or dad have been, um, have died for a variety of reasons. And so you have another breeder that comes in. So a step parent. Um, so there's a variety of things that then um, make that family unit a little more complicated over time but essentially it's a family unit and when i talk with kids when i'm doing education um, i oftentimes will use human families as a way to understand wolf families because there's a lot of similarities in um, how they're formed um, what they look like um, and how they interact so um, that is just really the core of it is that they're a family and where do these uh where do these packs typically make their home with with brown bears um you know they have a home range but brown bears are not territorial. It's a little bit different with wolves, correct? Yes, yes, wolves are very territorial. So when we look at both Alaska, which in Alaska, about 85% of Alaska has wolves. Um, and um, about um, a third, a little bit more in our forested areas in northern, northern northeastern Minnesota um, is where our wolf range is, right? So the good, space where you can have the good habitat where wolves can exist both in Alaska and Minnesota um, is um, well established by wolf packs. So when a wolf matures and becomes an adult and that maturity happens typically between about one and three years old, um, they will decide to leave the pack, um, which is called dispersal. They'll go out on their own and they're really looking for two things. They're looking to establish a territory of their own and to find a mate and start their own pack. Um, and we humans do that as adults too, or at least we hope that our children eventually will grow up and leave home and go to college, get a job and start their own family, right? It's very similar in that respect. So where they establish their territories 
is where there is not another wolf pack that has established that territory for themselves. And in an area where the wolf range is saturated, like Minnesota or Alaska, um, it can be a little bit complicated um, trying to eke out a space for yourself. So sometimes those dispersing um, individuals um, have to look for sometimes days, weeks, months um, to establish a territory for themselves. Um, so finding that available space um, is important. And sometimes they will go in and will try to um, become, like I said, like a step parent where a breeder has died. So they'll join another pack. Um, other times they will carve out a territory um, um, on the edge of another pack's territory, but they have to find a space where they can um, mark that territory as their own and claim it. it. Has to be available space. And gray wolves are some of the one of, we're one of the most widely ranging mammal species on on Earth. Yeah. Uh, so I know that probably varies considerably across the range, but in a, the um, Going back to Alaska, when can we, you know, expect uh, wolves in Alaska to give birth and raise their pups? Yeah, so um, so I'll start looking like with Minnesota. So we're at a much more southern latitude than Alaska is. So when wolves are born here is April into the very early parts of May. So as you go further north, that process is delayed. So in I have seen a range for Alaska from April into July. So in the more okay. southern parts of Alaska, I'm going to assume it's those earlier dates. And as you get further north, those dates are going to be delayed because spring comes later. And so those processes are also delayed um, in terms of mating and um, giving birth. And how long do, do pups typically stay at their dens, uh, you know, and how long do they take to become fully mature? Yeah, so um, the den, uh, which can be um, a site where a mother has dug a hole in the ground, a deep hole. She could also put, select um, um, under a, a roots of a tree that's kind of come up or fallen over. She might also use a cave or a rock outcropping as her den. And that's the first place that the pups are kept. And they stay there for about the first eight to maybe 10 weeks when they are from the time they're born and until that eight to 10 week period when they're most vulnerable is when they're in the den site. And mom stays with them um, for the first three weeks. She, they're most dependent on her at that point because they're only consuming her, her milk. And they're not at that point able to regulate their body temperature very well. So mom really needs to be close by. Um, and then as they get a little bigger, um, they develop their milk teeth, um, which occurs about 21 days of age. They can start eating some regurgitated meat that the other pack members are going out and getting through hunting and bringing back to them. And then when they get too big to fit in the den as a group, mom has to be able to fit in there and all the pups together. And as they grow, that gets harder and harder. Um, then they, they are, um, move out of that underground den, right, or the cave. And then they move to what's called a rendezvous site, which is where they spend the rest of their summer and into fall until about the end of October. And the rendezvous site is just what it sounds like. It's like an above ground den. It's a meeting place where the adults and the pups gather um, and join up um, when they've come back from hunting or exploring um, as the pups will do as they grow. Um, and so that's their meeting place. Um, until the end of summer when they start moving around their territory um, together as a pack and hunting and, uh, move, and moving around and, and being a more nomadic um, type group. And overall, wolves are thought to be uh, obligate predators of, of large animals. Uh, when you think moose, elk, deer, caribou. Mm -hmm. But, you know, their, adi their diet is, is somewhat adaptable. So, and I'm, not, I'm wondering actually how adaptable it is and how often do they take advantage of alternative food sources that aren't those big, large mammals? Yeah, you know, when we think about when wolf research is done, when we're looking at them most closely, especially around looking at feeding behaviors and things like that, um, a lot of that research has been done in winter. Uh, because it's easier, right? There's snowpack on the ground, the lakes and rivers are frozen. It's easier to spot them without um, leaves on the trees if you're flying over and doing surveys. 
So you can see what they're doing. And if you think about the winter time is also the most, the time when large ungulates like moose and deer and bison are most vulnerable. Um, they, you know, struggle in deep snow. It's harder for them to move around. They're getting less nutrition because there's not food available. And so wolves are in the winter time are really playing on that vulnerability um, to hunt those large ungulates. So that's, you know, we, we know most about those food sources. Um, and wolves really are looking for vulnerability. They are hunting animals that are much larger than they are. If you look at wolves in Alaska, the average weight range is about 85 to 115 pounds. And they're hunting animals, if you think about a moose, is 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. That's significantly right. larger than they are. So you're, they're not trying to take something that's healthy. They're trying to meet it at a point of vulnerability, whether that's illness, injury, old age. Um, sometimes it's vulnerability can mean that they're, they're testing that moose and it's running and it slips for some reason or it's at the end of the rutting season and it's just exhausted from all of its mating efforts and it's just vulnerable in that moment where in three weeks if they encountered that same moose, um, it wouldn't be as easy for them to eat. Um, so vulnerability is what they're looking for. Um, what we don't know a lot about is the food sources that they're um, looking to at other times of the year. Um, when the ungulates are not as vulnerable when they're at their healthiest point. So that's where some of this um, more current research, and there's a one project um, that in, is happening here in Minnesota at Voyagers National Park. It's called the Voyagers Wolf Project. And if people are interested, they have a website. You can look them up. They have a Facebook page, and they are on Instagram as well. And what they're looking at is those summer food sources. So what they do is they put... Um, radio tracking collars that use GPS on um, the wolves, and they try to collar at least one wolf pack, one wolf in each of the packs in their study area. So there's about 10 packs in their study area. And between April and October, they get a signal from that collar every 20 minutes. And if that wolf spends more than 20 minutes in one location, their technicians hike out to that location to see what are they doing. Because if they're spending more than 20 minutes somewhere, they're up to something. So they're looking at like, what are those food sources? And so some of the things that we've learned that in, in Minnesota, uh, white-tailed deer is their primary food source, their ungulate food source in Minnesota. And the fawns drop in late May and early June. And so there's a period of time where those fa fawns are also vulnerable. So they're eating a lot of fawns in uh, late May, early June, and into mid-July. But by mid-July, um, the fawns are um, on their feet, they're running faster than wolves and they're not as vulnerable. And so wolves are, are struggling at that point um, for that ungulate diet, at least in the short term. Because if you think about it, if the fawns are up and running and can outpace them, they're getting enough nutrition and so are the adults. It's going to be hard to find vulnerabilities in the ungulates. So that's when they're turning to those other food sources. Um, and it was interesting when we when I started to see the videos popping up of the wolves at Brooks Falls fishing because this project in northern Minnesota, um, as it was watching what the wolves were doing in a pack called the Bowman Bay Pack in 2017, they noticed that in April and um, mid April to mid May that this pack was spending an awful lot of time around this creek. So they hiked out. They saw a lot of fish bones and scales, and they said, there's something to this. Like, we think that these wolves are, are spending time fishing. So they put up trail cams there. And what they found over the, um, the next few years was that this same pack was returning at the time when the white suckers and the northern pike fish were spawning. And they're fishing and eating fish to help supplement their diet during that time. Fascinating. Um, yeah. So other food sources, as those fawns are starting to become less vulnerable, in northern Minnesota, it's blueberry season. And they're seeing that a bulk of their diet in from about mid-July to mid-August is blueberries, um, which we don't think about wolves eating fruit, but they will. Um, and sort of the idea behind it is, is there real nutrition coming out of that or is it a starvation food? It's keeping their bellies full. Um, 
and and they're leaning towards um, as they're doing the research that it's more of a of a starvation food. It's just keeping something in their belly until those other animals become more vulnerable. We've also seen evidence of them um, utilizing things. One one of the wolves in the study area got a trumpeter swan. Um, there was a turtle um, that they recorded in the scat. Um, and then as you get later into fall, um, we have we have black bears here in Minnesota and there is a hunting season on them. Uh, the wolves are frequenting the bait stations and then they're eating the gut piles um, from the bears that are being taken in the hunting season. So they're utilizing all kinds of food sources that we never really thought about. Um, and then another important food source in Minnesota is beaver. It's about 10 to 20% of their diet in spring, summer, and fall. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that they're supplementing in besides those ungulates when ungulates are hard to get. And we could probably make the same uh, or surmise that wolves in Alaska, uh, especially in the Alaska, Alaska Peninsula, are taking advantage of a lot of those same food resources. And uh, we, know, we know from watching the bear cams that bears are opportunistic um, and mm -hmm. they look for vulnerability in their play, prey as well. That's why we don't see bears swimming out in lakes chasing salmon because they know their prey aren't vulnerable in those locations. Right. So we see bears yeah. concentrating in areas where where uh, fish are vulnerable and we see the wolves doing the same thing. Uh, and with that background knowledge that we do have now about wolves, uh, mm -hmm. maybe we could talk more specifically about some of the wolves that we've seen at, at Brooks River. Uh, yeah. And at first, I'd like to you know, ask some questions about the, um, the appearance of those wolves. A lot of our bear cam viewers who have seen the wolves are wondering you know, whether or not we can identify it uh, whether it's male or female, just based on its body appearance. A lot of times it's hard to see genitalia, even on the bears, um, but on a yeah. smaller animal like a wolf, it's more difficult. Um, so is there a way that you can uh, maybe venture a guess whether um, the wolves we've been seeing are, are male and female, just based on their body size? I know, unfortunately, that is pretty difficult. Um, like, I, like I said earlier, the, the average um, weights, you know, in Alaska wolves is 115 are 85 to 115 pounds. And the um, there's about a 10 to 15 pound difference between males and females um, from the information that I've read about Alaska wolves. So that's not a very big difference to be able to look at them and tell. Now, if you had, an, if you had two wolves standing side by side and one was much larger than the other, you might be able to, to, to say, yeah, that bigger one is a male and the smaller is a female. But even when you look at this shot right here that we have up right now, those wolves are actually fairly close in size. Um, and so it's really hard to know for sure. One of the other things that, that, that kind of um, makes it difficult too is that this time of year they're shedding out their coat and they shed out at different right. rates. Some are shed out faster than others. And as they shed out their coat, um, I, you know, I, I oftentimes have to stop and just remind myself that, you know, like that everything is okay. When I look at like the captive wolves I worked with over the years, I'm like, oh, that's right. They're shedding. They're not losing a bunch of weight. They're just losing a bunch of fur. Um, and so that will just sort of distort like what you think their weight or size is because of the amount of um, undercoat that they've lost. So, so it's really, it's really quite difficult to just look at them and to be able to tell um, if they're male or female without rolling them over and looking at their genitalia. That okay. <laughs> is really tough. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to take a closer look on the cams as, as best we can. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the, yeah. the thing that's been giving us, um, you know, that, that's captured, of course, most of our attention when we've when seeing the wolf uh, is just uh, how good at fishing they actually are. Uh, the first day saw a wolf uh, earlier this week, uh, and I think this is footage from that first day, this wolf ended up catching about 30 fish. And after catching yeah. the fish, it would disappear into the trees along the riverbank. And, you know, and that's a lot of food. And we know that, um, you know, th there's a, a colloquial phrase, you know, if you're very hungry, you're, um, you're going to wolf your food down. So um, can you give us a little bit of an idea of how much food a wolf can eat? in one sitting. And there's also some follow-up questions I, I, I want to ask you yeah. about what that wolf might be doing, alternative things it might be doing with that fish. Yeah. So just as, as, a, as a baseline, wolves are feast or famine predators. They oftentimes will go seven to 10 days without a big meal. So when they do eat, they're capable of consuming a large amount of food. Um, and, how, and how we um, look at that is we say that 
um, a wolf can eat about 20% of its body weight in one sitting. So if you have a 100-pound wolf, it can hold 20 pounds of meat in its stomach at one time. So um, the fact you say it caught 30 fish and took them away, that isn't particularly surprising. Um, okay. You know, it's a little, and I'm not sure how much, what is the average weight of salmon in, in the creek? Do you know? Yeah, so those um, those fish are sockeye salmon, and they average yeah. four to eight pounds. So they're not they're not small fish at all. Um, but you know, there's also uh, you know we we know that um, you know bears and wolves are very smart, and that they can select for the more caloric rich parts of the fish. We yeah. see bears doing this constantly. We see bears um, mm -hmm. eating the brains, particularly. Yep. We see them eating the roe out of the fish, and we also um, see them stripping the skin off because that tends to be areas of the fish where fat are collected. So perhaps the wolf was doing something like that. I'm also curious to know, however, if the if the wolf could have been bringing food back maybe to young pups or something like that, could there have been a rendezvous site nearby? Yeah. 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 So I had actually was looking up related to some of the other things we're going to talk a little bit later on. I started to do some research and there was a study back in 2002, the, the primary um, uh, researcher on it was Daramont was the last name, and they were looking at the coastal British Columbia, and the, what they observed um, in that study was that wolves were only eating the brains of the fish. So if if that's all that they're consuming, they you know it would need a lot of fish just to eat that amount. Um, but you know, looking beyond that, um, right now, so we are in the beginning of July, so I could certainly make a good argument that that wolf, um, it could be a lone wolf, but I'm going to guess maybe part of a pack, right? If we said that, that that wolf is out mm -hmm. acquiring food, not just for itself, but to bring back to those pups, because it takes the entire pack working okay. together to ensure that those pups have a chance of survival to their first birthday. So it's doing one of a couple of things. Um, depending upon the age of the pups, um, if they're eating just regurgitated meat or if they're eating, if they're starting to eat food on their own um, and the distance from where um, the river is to where that um, den site or rendezvous site is um, would determine how that wolf was managing it. So if the wolves are just, if the pups are eating just regurgitated meat or it's a long distance away, that wolf is probably consuming everything that it can to take the food back to the pups in its stomach to regurgitate and share the food that way. If the rendezvous site um, was close by, they it, it could be just taking the fish and just running them, right, um, and bringing food back to the young. So one of those things, two things is could be happening. And if that wolf is part of the pack at this point, which I'm going to guess probably is, um, it's a guess on my part, but I'm, I'm thinking that, that, that that's it's what it's what its purpose is right now is just getting enough food to make sure those pups get um, get to, a chance to grow up. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't see very well into the forest at Brooks River. Even when you're on the ground there, it is uh, th the vegetation is very thick, um, so your lines of sight are extremely limited. And it's not with all the bears around; it's not really wise to go bushwhacking at this time of the year and look for <laughs> more signs of the wolf. So yeah. when I was there, I usually avoided that in July, just 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 to give the bears the space. So there are some things that maybe we're yeah. not going to know uh, with certainty about about yes. these animals. We we do know for sure, though, uh, that w that salmon can be a very important part of the diet of wolves in coastal North America, ranging you know from British Columbia up into Alaska. There's been a, a couple of studies done on uh, the diets of wolves uh, in Southwest Alaska, one from Lake Clark National Park, uh, and and one also from the Alaska Peninsula itself, including the Katmai region. Um, the, the study in Lake Clark and the one on the Alaska Peninsula found that there was a, just a wide variety of, of differences in the amount of salmon in a, in a wolf's diet. Some salmon had as much as, like one wolf in Lake Clark had as much as 89% of its summer diet uh, from salmon. And then uh, on the Alaska Peninsula year round um, in the Katmai region, it was about 28% of the wolf's annual mm -hmm. diet came from salmon, but the range was something as low as like 8% to as much as 48%. So it really, I think does vary depending on the wolf uh, and, yes. and what it's learned to do, to do overall. One question along the lines of salmon and wolves, though, it happens to be um, 
something that's present on the West Coast of the United States, and that happens to be salmon poisoning disease. Uh, a lot of people have been wondering about that and how that might impact wolves uh, in, in Katmai, uh, if at all, or in, in, in other places. So um, what is salmon poisoning disease and how does it affect canines? Yeah, so this was new to me because we don't see that here in Minnesota. Um, in terms of salmon, um, it, salmon is not a, um, a species that we had here until a few decades ago when it was intentionally introduced into Lake Superior, which is one of the Great Lakes. And so um, I was like, oh, well, that's really interesting. So, um, you know, I did a, a lot of research on it preparing for this. Um, and salmon poisoning disease um, is found in fish that swim upstream. So salmon, trout would be a couple of good examples of that. And um, what it is, is it's a parasite. The Nanophytus salmoncola is the parasite. Um, and the parasite in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. But that parasite can be infected with a, a rachis racocell bacteria um, that um, causes the problem. So when a canid um, consumes raw fish that has the, the, um, the parasite with the bacteria embedded in it, and that reaches their intestinal tract, the parasite then releases the bacteria, which infects the canid system. And, I, and it doesn't seem to affect raccoons, bears, members of the cat family. It just seems to be problematic for um, canids. And if it's not treated um, pretty quickly, it sounds like within about 14 days it can be fatal. Um, that bacteria can travel to all the major systems of the body um, and uh, cause severe illness that leads to, to, to death. So, um, and, and like we said, like it's only found, um, it looks like from San Francisco um, through the Pacific Northwest up into about Puget Sound is where um, they seem to be um, finding it. And they have had cases in domestic dogs, coyotes, and fox from the research I could, I could find, but they don't, I couldn't find any documented cases of it showing up in wolves. So the question is why? Um, as I mentioned in that study, I was reading that that from British Columbia that what they observed is that wolves are only eating the brain. So if they're doing that, um, there is a nutritional value, but is it also reducing the parasite load where they're not they're not ingesting the parasite or not enough of it? Um, is it because in the Pacific North Northwest, um, as far as like Oregon and Washington and Northern California? the wolf populations have not recovered there enough or there are not enough individuals that are getting exposed to raw fish at this point that would have the parasite. Um, there could be something to that there. I, I just don't think we know enough. Um, and then the other part of it too is when, it, when a wild animal dies, we don't always have a chance to obtain its body and do a necropsy to find out like what did it die from. In fact, that that's a, it's actually, um, a much more rare Very occurrence rare. to be able to yeah. 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 Um so so all of those things kind of maybe play into this. But it but and, it is fascinating. Yeah, it, it it is um you know the, to look at the interface of of the you know the parasites in the life cycle that uh utilize salmon as an intermediate host. Um mm -hmm. there you know there's there's just not you know the the flukes that live in um, salmon, but there's also tapeworms and things like that. So, uh, you know, and, and wild animals that feed on salmon have to deal with that. Uh, the the salmon poisoning disease, you know, it needs, uh, the, the fluke itself actually needs an, another host besides just salmon and a mammal. It actually needs a snail too, from what yes. I've read. So, and that snail, I don't think is, is present in, um, you know, uh, in Southwest Alaska at all. So the wolves up here, I don't know they would really have to, uh, you know, worry about yeah. that disease. But yeah, it's it's wonderful to sort of think about, you know, having wolves in other areas adapting to it, maybe just eating the brains because that's the only safe part of the fish for them. These are very yeah. intelligent animals. Their bodies tell them a lot of stuff about what's going on, what's good for them and what's, what's bad yeah. for them. So yeah. really, really interesting yeah. things. 
Yeah. And, and not all, you know, we just, parasites are actually, go ahead. Pas parasites are actually an interesting study, right? There's a lot of parasites out there. They, they have some pretty interesting life cycles and how they impact the behavior of animals. Um, and, and so to be able to kind of dig into that and kind of learn more is, um, is a, is a interesting study. I know we have, a I don't know, do you guys have brain worm, um, that affects ungulates, um, in Alaska? We have that here in regards to deer and moose. Yeah, I'm um, not so sure. that's another one that has a, Yeah, so um so and the, it also has an intermediary where it has to go through a snail to be able to get complete its life cycle. So there's all of those things that play into how those how those things affect different species. Um and we can say just for the, the audience that you know if you think your dog has been exposed, like it's digging through trash or it's gotten into raw fish and it's become ill, you need to make sure to tell your vet that. And they can treat it if they catch it early enough with antibiotics and a dewormer. Um, and so that's good news from that perspective for domestic pets. Yeah, that's great to know. And uh, you know, we've, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from you uh, during our chat today. I think we have time for maybe just one more question. And this is uh, more of a yeah. personal question, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what do you admire most about, uh, with, about wolves? Oh, and you know, I think this is probably true about a lot of wild animals, but I really admire um, the fact that they persist through so much. Um, you know, they deal with a lot of challenges throughout their life, starvation, injury, illness, um, and they still are able to survive and thrive. When we do actually get our hands and are able to necropsy those wild wolves and they've died, um, you can see the all that they've gone through in their lifespan by just looking at their bodies, broken and rebroken ribs, um, cracked and missing teeth, and yet somehow they're able to still feed themselves and hunt. Um, and so just, uh, I just admire them a lot for their tenacity and their ability to, to go through a lot and still, still survive as a species and, and move forward. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Well, yeah, uh, wonderful stuff, um, great information. Um, I would, would like to thank you again uh, for joining yeah. me today. Uh, my my guest today has been um, Missy Stein from the International Wolf Center. If you want to know more about wolves and the work that the International Wolf Center does, uh, please go to wolf.org. They have a lot of fascinating information uh, on their website, including lots of in information about their individual wolves that they have at their center. And you can watch many of those wolves on the wolf cam. So you can just go to explore.org slash wolf if you're looking for a short link for that. But yeah, Missy, thanks again for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Pitt with Explore.org. Never stop learning.